All righty, automotive enthusiast friends from all around this great big blue marble, you've done it once again. You've hit the play button on yet another... Kevin, another accelerated episode <laughs> of V8 Radio. Accelerated. Does that mean we have to talk fast? Pretty much. Oh, man. Well, I think today on a lot of these podcast players, you can click that button and speed up the playback. Right. We're going to be on one and a half times naturally. <laughs> It's the only way my wife gets through these. (laughs) Uh, Yes, another accelerated episode of the V8 Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined, as always, by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cuball-Clark, and our very special guest, Mr. Mike Spagnola. Hey, good morning. Good morning. And we're coming to you from the PRI show in Indianapolis, uh, and our friends at ARP have allowed us to uh, occupy their space to record this on site, so we appreciate that. And uh, as you know... We like to start every episode with an automotive trivia question. Did you get my text, Mike? I did, but I didn't do anything with it. Oh. <laughs> well, that's okay. You can uh, you can choose to bow out. That's all right. Yeah, I'm bowing out on this one. So yeah. you, you can, though, throw in guesses on ours. Okay, How for about sure. That? Have you prepared a trivia question? I have prepared a trivia question. So, Kevin, we are at the PRI show, and we're surrounded by people who like to go fast. For sure. Um a lot of good people who like to go fast, but there's also some not so good people who like to go fast, namely Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, so they met their demise while driving a certain car. Ooh. What was that car? Well, because I'm a generous person, Ooh. I'm going to let our guest throw a guess out for me <laughs> <laughs> first. I have a. I'm going to say an old, a Buick. Huh? Maybe. No. Maybe. You never know. Okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll find out at the you'll end of the show. You'll find out at the I end will, of the show. Huh? Okay. That's your final answer? I think it is. All right. The Buick. Yeah. All right. Final answer. Yep. Final All right. Answer. Dig it. Kevin. I'm going to say it's a 1938 Buick. 1938 Buick. Right. Or maybe a 40. Or but maybe a what? Maybe a 40. But I'm going to say Buick yeah, as well. I was thinking a little older, but you might be right. You might All be right. right. So Mike says a Buick. And Kevin says a 40. Sure. 40 Buick? Yeah, right. why not? 40 Buick. But Buick definitely stands out for some yeah, reason. For some reason to me, too. All right. Of course, I could have thrown you off by just saying that. No, I was thinking before you said that. Yeah, okay. Duly um, noted, fellas. Unless right. it's wrong, then I'm going to say, you ruined it for <laughs> me. You planted that. <laughs> uh, you, you made me suggest that. That's right. Uh, okay. Um, I have one for you. And Later. you. Okay. All right. So you're uh, uh, probably all familiar with the uh, American Racing brand of wheels. Yes, of mm. course. One of the founders, often known as like almost the founder of aftermarket performance speed parts, uh, and of course their wheel, the uh, the torque thrust is very very famous. They do another wheel called the 200S, which is known as the Daisy or the Coke bottle. Right. Okay. You familiar? Sure. All right. This is going great. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. <laughs> Where did the 200S get its name? Ooh. Wow. Because I'm generous, I'm going to give our guests <laughs> yeah, yeah. the answer first. Thanks for throwing me out of the You website. got it. You got it, Mike. Uh, oh, the 200S. Yes. Gosh, I have no idea. And I had those wheels on my 66 Barracuda. Uh-huh. Everybody oh, had a set of them. Oh, man. The 200S. Yeah. So, knowing the nomenclature of a lot of the uh, American racing products, if there's a if there's a letter, it stands for something, you know, like uh, 200 mile an hour super sport. Oh, mm. ooh, ooh. Well, that was my guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 200 mile an hour. I'm probably way sport. off on that one. Well, it's uh, it sounds good. It sounds great. That's your final. That's my final. All right, and I'm. Purely pour that. It's okay. Uh, that's, that's what we do around here because there's nothing to win, so yeah. don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, you should have told me that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I would have said a Tesla. Or something. <laughs> right. What's the 200 S? Yes. Stand for. Where did it come from? Where does it stand? What for? is it? Where, where did the name come from? Yeah. <sighs> oh boy. Um, well, the obvious answer has already been taken, so I'm really gonna have to come up with something outlandish here. Right. And the, the listeners are clicking that speed up button yep, right now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the 200 S. So the S is just means, uh, it means series. Series. And yeah. the 200 is the 200th design Ooh. 
that they came uh, up with to produce that wheel. So along, Much like in the, lo- in the lines of WD-40. Just going to say. Yeah. Good idea. 200 design iteration. That's a good pull, Mike. That's, that's not bad. Uh, you know. Serious. You got to keep thinking with this guy. <laughs> uh. At least somebody here thinks. Yeah, right. It's not me. All right. Well, we'll find out at the end of the show. Uh, in the meantime, we welcome Mr. Spagnola, the uh, CEO of the Specialty Equipment Market Association. My gosh, joining us in our presence, we're honored. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's yeah. Exciting, as always. It is exciting <laughs> to hang out with you guys. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> we need to get out more often. <laughs> uh, so we're here at PRI, which, uh, it's interesting, is, um, it's an, you know, it's hard to, for me to articulate exactly the relationship because it, it's kind of an arm of SEMA. It's kind of owned by SEMA, but it's it's its own deal. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we purchased PRI about 10 years ago, but we really wanted it to be its own thing. We didn't, you know, people said, don't seem to eyes it. You know, make uh, sure uh, it yeah, stays right. its grassroots, its racing heritage, its uh, what it does. And uh, so we've tried to preserve that. We really have tried to make sure that it um, stands on its own. We do what we call a lot of common kitchen things where the, um, you know, for example, accounting, accounting and legal, and, you know, some of the arms of SEMA, are shared with PRI, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it also goes its own way in several things, like this, like this PRI show. And this show's awesome. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, we were holding our breath a little bit over the summer. Um, yeah. But, but it, uh, you know, uh, these shows always, as the economy comes back and as we get out of COVID sure. and those sort of things, you wonder if you build it when they come and they're definitely here. Do we know how attendance has been versus shows just a couple of years ago? Yeah, we'll know a little bit more in the next week, but for sure it's up from last year. Right? Oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I think we're getting back to, like the SEMA show, I think we're getting back to about 2019 levels. Killing. And so those those were big years for us. Yeah, for yeah, sure. That, you, all you have to do is walk the aisles here and see that you can't almost walk the aisles. You know, no, so that, and that's true. Shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. It's funny because I was recording some other uh, things here and there, and you know, typically I can visit somebody and say, hey, do you have a minute? And this year they're like, no, mm-hmm. we don't have any time. There's so many people here we got to talk to. So wow. it's been great. And the racing crowd is so passionate and they don't let the rest of the world affect what they want to do. Right. And they're all here. Right. Yeah, it is exciting to see that. You know, the the uh, customer base and even the manufacturers between SEMA and PRI, some people think, okay, is it the same show, just labeled as PRI? There's only about a 30% crossover of manufacturers that are here yeah. that go to SEMA. Really? So, yeah, so a lot of different manufacturers come here than at SEMA. And same with the uh, same with the customers, same with the buyers. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's a completely different crowd, close to, close to a different crowd. Yeah. Of course, here in the heart of Indy, you know, you get that Midwest and East Coast crowd anyway. And really, even from sure. Europe. You know, it's fun to see people here from Europe this year. Well, that's the other thing is the, you know, this is a racing show, but it's not any one form of racing. So you're walking down the aisle with somebody who races shifter carts, and on the other side is F1. I mean, for real. That's killer. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And you also mentioned the SEMA show. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about that. That was off the charts this year, too. It was. It was. Again, uh, we were excited to see. We were up about 35% uh, over last year. And again, just about back to 2019 numbers. And that's without overseas. You know, we still don't have uh, most of Asia. You know, certainly China's still shut down. And that's usually a pretty big contingent, you know, another four or 500 booths. So, uh, oh, man. It was, yeah, it was it was off the charts. Yeah. Did I hear a figure that there was uh, uh, 500 or more uh, new exhibitors this year? Yep. It, that, that tends to happen every year. We tend to get about, you know, between three and 600 new exhibitors every year. And uh, so that's exciting to see. And, of course, some fall off. Sure. You know, if you can make it as any business, mm-hmm. it's, you know, you get uh, of those 500, about 250 come back the second year. Mm-hmm. And it dwindles down a bit to a couple hundred. But it, that's why we grow. It's because those yeah. guys But the fact away. you're still getting new exhibitors year yeah. over year is a great sign. It, it's always ama- amazing to me how you see these new exhibitors and they come up with some widget. And you're like, what's the same thing you say, right? Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Or, or that isn't going to work, and then yeah. they're here forever, you know. <laughs> you know, one of the funny ones along those lines was when these uh, um, throttle manipulation devices right. came out. So you, you buy a new car, and the throttle pedal is no longer a cable. It's drive by wire. Right. And you step on the gas, and then the computer moves the throttle blade. And there are people that sell these tuners that you plug in the OBD 
two port, right? And then it accelerates the the opening of oh, throttle. The open time. So oh, so all of a sudden the car, you know, kind of feels faster. Sure. And the first time I saw that, I'm like, really? And next thing you know, it won a new product award at yep. SEMA, and and it's like a hot. Th- and people yeah. are like, yeah, that's like the first thing you do now. It, you know, it's, it is. Yeah, install yeah. one of those. Yeah, it just accelerates the. You know, it almost becomes like a cable now, but electric. Well, and a quicker yeah. opening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, because the OEs kind of dumb down your foot in case you accidentally blip the throttle. Yeah. You know, it doesn't do anything then, but now, now it does. So those go through emissions compliance. They have to be mm-hmm. uh, CARB certified, and we we do, I think, one of those every month. At the, at really? The yeah, yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Well, so speaking of the uh, the SEMA garage there, um, what was it? Almost ten. How how how? When did the Southern California SEMA Garage program get off the ground? Yeah, I came on almost 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years in February of uh, next year. And uh, so that's when we started it. And we opened it, uh, sections of it anyway, around uh, June, July. Uh, so it's coming up on 10 years. And that was your essentially way in the door at SEMA from the management side. Right. Yeah, I uh, had been asked to come on and create the SEMA Garage. I'd done a lot of product development in, in a previous life and worked with all the OEs. And uh, so we had this idea to create the SEMA garage to help other manufacturers go through product development. And uh, I agreed to come do that on a three-year contract. And so I'm almost 10 years into my three-year contract. <laughs> nice. So. Well, don't worry, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, yesterday, I had the uh, good fortune of chatting. We did a, an episode with Ben Kaminsky and, oh. and heard all the updates on the Detroit version. And uh, it's funny, I think a lot of people product manufacturers understand the emissions compliance and and the federalization of their products but i don't know that a lot of consumers know what has to happen to to be able to buy that part off the shelf and install it on the car and and that's it's not only the sema garage is not only a place where you can test things but if you're really you know if cue ball gets an idea to launch a product you need to call the garage like now because they've been through every step of this and can at least guide you sure. and maybe even provide some actual service. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you uh, develop any product that affects fuel or air for, you know, for a, uh, an engine, it's got to go through emissions testing uh, to be legal and to, to pass the uh, uh, California Air Resources Board and EPA standards. And the fines for not doing that, if you get caught selling that, let's say a supercharger uh, and it gets out on the market and you've not gone through that testing, the fines start at $37,500 per part sold. <laughs> wow. <laughs> per part sold. So yeah, per part a, sold. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so that would hurt pretty quick. So the, the cue ball blower needs to get yeah. investigated here well, before. I, I did have a great idea when I was a kid. I'm sure. I was riding my bike home and I was probably 10 and I had this epiphany. I said, you know what we, you know what we need? Is not a gear shifter, not not an automatic shifter, but a push button uh, oh, yeah. thing for for a transmission, for an automatic transmission. And I went home and I told my mom, and she gave me that look that only a mother could do to her son. Like you are the dumbest kid <laughs> in the world. Chrysler has done that for years. I said, uh, no, that okay. only means it was a good idea. It was, you know, it was a good idea. I'm just I was a little after my time though. Well, by okay. the way, because now they're back to that. They are back. To they that. are. Yeah, that's the an, dial on the ramp trucks, yeah. the dial in your gear. That, that's pretty good at ten. At ten, I think I was still putting the baseball card with the with the <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. into, the, yeah. into the spokes to make noise. Yeah. Uh, well, no, we actually heard. You know, you were around ten. Uh, you know, with your Mickey Thompson models. Yeah, uh, I was. Doing oh, that. Right. <laughs> I heard about that. Yeah. That was uh, an amazing, amazing deal that you presented me with. But. Well, that was fun. I was just happy to be able to connect those dots and. Uh, and we, we did discuss that in a previous episode, right. but I kind of surprised Mike with a, a model kit that he had from his from his youth, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we all do this. So uh, how old were you when you got bit by the car bug? Oh, I, I can remember at six or seven years old. Is that right? But yeah. The, the guys were coming back from Vietnam, and you mm-hmm. know and those guys that did come back were buying Mustangs and sure. Camaros. GTOs. And, yeah, and, yeah, GTOs yeah, and, and all that. Yeah. And I would hear them a block or two away, and I'd run out on the curb. Oh, and, and, watch him, and watch them go by and mm-hmm. uh, give them the thumbs up, and, you know, big grins. And uh, I was just always, you know, I think for a lot of us too, we started taking apart bicycles and then motorcycles and then cars. And, and uh, yep. but very early on for sure. Very, very early on. And then model cars, all, you know, all of them. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an early stage of my life for sure. That's cool. Yeah. Right on. Now, you, you, um, 
You use the term that you've been in product development and all this kind of stuff before getting involved with SEMA, but I don't know if a lot of people know kind of your story of career-wise, some of the stuff that you've done. Yeah, so, uh, you know, done everything from probably started in the, well, I started actually at a Datsun dealership. Is that right? Yeah, right out of high school. Yeah. Literally sweeping the floors and uh, doing the delivery truck. You are aging yourself, sir. (laughs) I know. I know. But because I love Datsun 510s and 240Zs and all that. But how cool, uh, those cars are so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, uh, you know, while I was going to college, worked at this car dealership, was going to college at night, and uh, I wanted to go SCCA racing, so, you know, built up. Dotson Roadster, and then moved up to a 510, and then moved up to a 240Z, and then uh, got into the Formula Continental side of the business. And Formula, mm-hmm. well, back then it was Formula B, which is now Formula Atlantic. Mm-hmm. So I had a pretty good cool. CCCA career. Nice. Uh, and then, uh, but worked in a variety of uh, positions in an import car parts chain. Uh, moved my way up to a VP of sales and marketing, and then left to uh, buy up a little company. Uh, so over the years, it's been five companies, you know, bought and sold, mm-hmm. and uh, it's been a fun ride. So my whole career uh, has just been in the automotive business yeah. and in the industry, and something I'm, again, I pinch myself. You know, <laughs> yeah, I get get to be part of. That's it. really incredible. Still passionate yeah. about it. Still mm-hmm. try to read up on every trade and, and understand what's going on. And, uh, try to stay with the times. You know, coming to a show like this, I get to see what's new and. Uh, what's different? You know, mm-hmm. Meet a lot of new people coming in. It's so excited to see the next gen come into this industry and you know do it differently. And mm-hmm. yeah, you know. Well, what's cool is that you've had experience on all sides of this. You know, as an enthusiast, as a racer, as a guy pushing a broom and a dealer, to a business owner multiple times, and uh, so so having those type of perspectives, I think, are are critical, especially in the role you're in now, because right. you can identify and and converse with anybody here. And kind of feel their pain in some way. It is, and it, you know, for me, uh, of course, I spend a lot of time in the office. You know, unfortunately, uh, pushing paper, and, uh, but you know, working with the team on everything from the SEMA show to the SEMA garage, SEMA data, and uh, you know, getting to talk to our team and, and hearing what they want to do. And you know, sometimes I stay out of their way, and sometimes I try to give them some advice. But uh, you know, building that team up and having all that is, is a great challenge. But I got to tell you, I love getting out and seeing members. Yeah. I love just, uh, you know, about six, seven weeks ago, I got to go to the Roadster shop in, yeah, yeah. in Chicago, and, mm-hmm. uh, and just getting out to see see our members and seeing what they're doing, and mm-hmm. you know, seeing a car up on a hoist. That, that's still fun. That's still it, yeah. It's pretty eye opening to see what a lot of these companies are doing. Right. Uh, I think we've got four Roadster shop chassis in our shop right now, and they're, wow. they're working on three more for us. Uh, and their ability to manufacture that thing uh, is it's, it's incredible, you know. It, and yesterday amazing. I was chatting with uh, uh, with a gentleman from the garage shop, which is a uh, you know th- these guys build land speed cars, and they're doing a, a 65 Corvette, right? So it's a it's a coupe, and the way that they're doing the roll cage is they put a scanner inside the car, and they they 360 scan the interior, then they take that and go into SolidWorks and design the cage. And then they just send that file to the SCTA who analyzes it and says, no, you gotta move this or this isn't right. No really? So the cage design is certified before it's built, before they even start on it. So then they'll get the any revisions that they need, go out in the shop and build it. That's, that's awesome. Right, it's unbelievable, the technology. It really is, yeah. And, and uh, just evolution of hot rodding, you know? It is. Yeah, you know, where, where in the past you would have to build that cage, and then get it inspected. It's like, nah, not good enough. You gotta, like you said, move this this way. That's got to be thicker. That weld's not right. Well, and if you then think about it, all over again. to use that specific example, first you got a bunch of guys scratching their heads about how they're going to put a halo bar in a Corvette. Right. You know, so how, yeah. that. But then if you don't get it right, what do you do? You take it to the take it to Bonneville, fail inspection. So you just burned all this time, all this money to get there, right. and you can't even run. <laughs> So, so, you know, in general, we were having this discussion because there was some concern, even when the Seaboard Garage got going, that the technology we now have would take the soul out of building things. Mm. It would take, you know, mm. I mean, we can scan anything now. If you can see it, you can scan it. And then once you've scanned that, you can put it in CAD. Uh, mm. And then from there, you can 3D print it and test your model. And there, there were people that were like, 
well, that takes the soul out of things. That you know, uh, we've we've scanned a different you know engine going into a different vehicle, and we scan the engine bay, and we've done all that in CAD to make sure that the engine fits, and where do you build the cross member, all those sort of things. But I got to tell you, I, I think it's just improved. If, uh, every year that we go to the SEMA show or we see the builds here, they just get more and more incredible. I mean, they are not only pieces of art, but the engineering and the technology that goes into them mm-hmm. are just absolutely gorgeous and yeah. faster and safer and all those sort of things. So uh, I don't think it's any, taken any of the rawness or any of the cool factor out of the build. It's just, well, somebody still has to weld that cage together. Right, right. You know, and, and do the the handwork to, to make it all work. It's just now they can get there a little faster. And at the same time, if you choose to do things in a traditional way, you know, all analog with nothing, that's awesome too. Sure. You know, there's sure. nothing wrong with that. No, for sure. For sure. But, you know, the, the you know, for example, the Battle of the Builders at Sea I mean, it just gets absolutely more and more beautiful and crazy and <laughs> wild. And, and when you think it's not going to get topped, Somebody trumps somebody and it <laughs> builds something like this year. Oh yeah, incredible. Th- this year was off the off the chain with the, uh, the the Ring Brothers truck, if you will. You know, they they basically smashed an F car, an F one car yeah. into a you know forty eight Chevy pickup truck. And holy cow! Yeah, the whole you can't even describe it. it, it if you took a, a Formula One chassis, that type of suspension, yeah. all carbon fiber, monocoque, and then the top half was he chopped. 40 Chevy pickup truck. I mean, it, oh wow, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was crazy. It was. You're right. It was like a Formula One car. Yeah, and I think that was one of their goals. You know, yeah. was to, to try and do that. So it, it had the tire. It had the. I mean, it had everything. Um, it's funny when you, you talk about some of this stuff, and I think you don't have to understand it all either. You know, I think some people feel pressured, like, well, I don't have that scanner. I don't. Right. I can't. I don't have an autoclave to make carbon fiber thing. That's okay. You don't have to. You can I, still contribute to the industry. You still make cool stuff. Yeah. I, I still work out of my home garage. I've got a shop and I work out of my home garage. And there's no lift. So, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, mm. I'm, I'm on the ground underneath the car at times, you know, putting a transmission back in without a lift. Uh, no, well, brother. <laughs> speaking of that, you, uh, uh, you built a car for SEMA this year, or heavily modified one, um, that new Z. Tell me about that. Yeah, that, that was uh, that was a bit of a thrash. So uh, I've had a really a SEMA car yeah, a thrash. <laughs> right, you doing something wrong, Mike? <laughs> Every year I say I'm never doing this again. Every year I say I'm never doing this again. This was actually fairly easy. It wasn't it wasn't uh, a Resto Mod '69 Mustang like the year past. But uh, this year I had a opportunity to buy one of the new Nissan Zs. And I've got this because of my years at Datsun and racing them and all that. I've got a bit of a Datsun collection. So. When I saw the new Z at SEMA last year, I, I put one mm. on order, and uh, and it came in a couple of weeks before uh, the mm. SEMA show, and then trying to get product for it was not easy. So all the product came in the Tuesday before the SEMA show, and uh, <laughs> Jeez. and uh, we went to town and you know put uh, put a set of Burbo brakes on it and KW suspension and um, Negretti exhaust and you know a bunch of pieces and parts mm-hmm. and uh, and got it to the show on time and you know even tried to set the suspension levels and all that was kind of a last minute thrash but relatively easy build um, I'm anxious now to put a few miles on it and start to do some engine mods mm-hmm. carb legal of course uh, absolutely some, yeah, some, yeah. well at least you know a place where you can take it yeah. to find <laughs> out yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so on that platform that's a clean sheet right there, so yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. suspension's out of a 370Z, so that made okay. it easy okay, good. to get suspension for it. But, you know, new twin-turbo motor. Uh, the car's 400 horsepower to start. Those guys are already pushing them up over 600 horsepower. Oh, I can imagine. And so, uh, you know, I'll probably be somewhere in the middle, maybe keep it around 500, mm-hmm. just to get some drivability out of it. And, and uh, But it's uh, it's a car that'll get into trouble yeah. <laughs> with, with a big smile on your face. But not with it, the EPA. Yeah, no, no, no. no it handles great, and... Uh, it's it's uh it's kind of my daily driver right now. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Could you have imagined back in the day working on a Nissan or a Datsun Z car that was you know street driven five hundred you know horsepower keep it keep it mild keep it mild yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. with with brakes that are you know yeah, people, I mean you know you see sixteen eight hundred horsepower now out of street cars but people don't realize what 
five to seven horsepower, five to seven hundred horsepower is. I mean, it it's a handful. It'll get you in trouble. I think a lot of and and so you mentioned next generation, which I love. I love how a lot of younger people have now grown up with factory 400 horsepower cars 500 600 yeah. so when you tell them oh look you know there's a there's a 375 horse chevelle they're like who cares yeah, right, right? that's junk and they have no idea what it took to make 500 horsepower even 15 years ago right, right, right. You know? to be streetable right yeah, yeah. right and legal yeah uh, but i think that's great right. you still can't beat the sound of it oh no yeah the older v8 for sure just, but uh, so, but your son's into it too, full on. Yeah, yep. I have uh, three three kids: uh, 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 Andrew, my oldest, and then Mary, my in the middle, and mm-hmm. then, uh, Mikey, my youngest. But Andrew and Mikey are both in the yeah. in the business, um, which is fun to see and uh, fun to watch them grow up and do what they do. Andrew's in the uh, off road side, and Mike's in the kind of the tuner side of the business, mm-hmm. and uh, they come home with new stories and fun things and then sometimes it's like you know dad I'm having this issue and it's like yeah I've, I've seen that 20 times you know? <laughs> right so uh, yeah. uh, but uh, you know sometimes they take my advice sometimes they don't which, which, how it is. which is what's going to happen yeah so, but it's fun to watch them in the business it's fun to watch them grow um, I really try to let them be on their own and not influence them too much because I I want them to learn on their own I want them to see what they're For doing sure. uh, I don't you know I don't think uh, it's always healthy to have, have dad's help or watch it over them. Um, you know, they gotta they gotta break their knuckles once in a while too. So, mm-hmm. uh, but they do a great job at it. And, and then my daughter's a stay-at-home mom and raising two young boys, and, which I get to go, you know, tease and put a lot of sugar in them and then, yeah. then hand them back to them. <laughs> We'll take them for riding your Z. Yeah, get them, do. Oh, yeah. on the car oh, thing too. But we got four grandkids, and all four are car enthusiasts. Awesome. Ready. I gotta tell you, yeah. they are absolute. Uh, my oldest grandson is uh, six, and he's racing motorcycles. So, really? Yeah. That's yeah, and, and winning. And that's winning. killer. I gotta tell you. Oh, right. So he's not just riding. Yeah, no, no, he's winning. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's great. Um, I talked to a guy yesterday. It's uh, a family where. Um, We'll, we'll call him grandfather and grandfather's brother. Grandfather went to Bonneville for the first time in 61. Uh-huh. And his brother went for the first time in 69. He was supposed to go in six, but then had this little Vietnam thing happen. So he mm. couldn't go to, to 69. So they've been racing there since then. Uh, the next generation is uh, you know, probably my age. And, and uh, he's been racing at Bonneville and drag racing and has records. His sister also has a record. Their three kids wow. all have records. And grandfather's wife at age 69 said, I want to play. So they built nice. her a car and nice. she's got records, uh, you know, on the salt. And, you know, I asked uh, the, the third generation um, kid, whose name's also Michael, very popular around here, uh, you know, what it's like, you know, what, what do your friends think? And he's like, yeah, you know, a lot of them just don't get it. And I said, have they ever been to the track? And he's like, well, no. And I said, that's the thing. And he said, you know, when, when he saw Speed Demon go by at mile three at, you know, 380, 400 miles an hour, he's like, oh, that's what I wanted that's to do. It. So to your point of getting the kids in the car and, and as early as possible is what's going to, you know, hook them yeah. and show them how cool and fun this stuff is. Yeah, my problem is my we go out and do track days now, and my two sons beat me by <laughs> several seconds. Oh out. man, and it's it's uh, it's a uh, that's not very good. I got to tell you a funny story. I was walking through the hall yesterday, and uh, there was a husband and wife in front of me, and you could tell they were kind of arguing a little bit. And he said, "You know, if they get into this stuff, they're not going to have any money, so they can't buy drugs." <laughs> 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 oh, that's great. Brilliant. <laughs> you know, that's and that's a funny analogy. There's an, another friend of mine who's a drag racer, uh, long time, and we were talking about Formula One one night, and he's like, I don't know anything about F1. And I'm, I, I was very surprised by that because F1's like the pinnacle, you know? <laughs> right, no. uh, and, and he said, no, here's the thing. I'm not into F1 for the same reason I'm not into cocaine, because I know I'd like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he said, I would just dive in head first, yeah. and I would no, bury it. Brother. In it's true, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It will get you. I still, I mean, coming here is still hard for me because I want to buy everything, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, when you were talking before about uh, racing the 510 and, and, you know, those cars, 
one of the coolest things that, that I've had a chance to do was actually at SEMA, at SEMA Central a couple of years ago, uh, and did about a 15 minute interview with Peter Brock he, and heard the whole hero. BRE racing story and, and wow. his evolution from, well, from GM, uh, you know, working on Corvettes to Shelby and then to the Datsun side of things. Um, unbelievable. Yeah. So uh, when I was, you know, young and trying to build these cars and doing that kind of work, I used to go down to El Segundo to Mac Tilton shop, Tilton Engineering, mm. and they're, they're here at the yeah, show, actually. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I would go down there and almost just hang out to see if, if a John Morton or a, a Pete Brock or one of those guys would show up, because uh, occasionally they will. I never got to see them, mm. but you know, I'd hear stories with other guys I'd race with that they were at the shop. And I always missed them, but I did get to know Mac Tilton pretty good. And, he took me under his wing a little bit and kind of helped me with what I was building. And then some of the guys at, at uh, Nissan Datsun back then kind of took an interest as well and uh, ended up giving me a body of white uh, to build one of my cars. And uh, so I got to know those guys and, you know, took their used parts when I could. And, sure, <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, I remember Max sold, sold me an old fiberglass seat out of one of the original 510 race cars. Oh, they, cool. Because they were upgrading. And, yeah. You know, and that was uh, cool for me to have. You know, I always wondered who sat in that seat. And, For sure, and, right? You know, and which tracks it ran on. But yeah, uh, it was that was cool. But so, yeah, Pete Pete Brock's just he's come to the garage a few times. And yeah, it's always fun to hang out with him. Absolutely. Um, and I don't know how well you know that story, but when after the Shelby years, you know, Pete was a designer, but also an engineer and a racer. So he uh-huh. he's another one of these guys that got everything about the the car. Uh, and, and Shelby, you know, Ford kind of pulled out of, of their, they, they did the Le Mans thing mm-hmm. and they're like, hey, move on. And, and Shelby's <laughs> yeah. like, okay, everybody go home. And uh, Brock got involved with, uh, with Dotson at the time. And Dotson's like, yeah, we're going to put our Z car on the track and, and go clean house road racing everywhere because we want to sell cars in the U.S. And, and you know, you went on Sunday, sell Monday. Right. And uh, Brock said, you know, what would be more amazing is if you took the boxiest, most pedestrian looking thing yeah. you have and go win with that and that was the 510 and that's how wow. those little sedans became such hot race cars they put everything in them and then they're cleaning house and it was just like this shouldn't be happening <laughs> right. what is going on here and go go buy a good 510 race car today you're going to spend a minimum minimum of 50 grand oh yeah Holy yeah, cow. yeah. <laughs> wow yeah. a friend of mine uh where i grew up a few blocks away first had a uh a showroom stock uh, Camaro. So it was a 95 uh, one LE car. Yeah. And it was a six speed manual, you know, 350. And, and he did a little bit of work to that. And we'd go, you know, road racing on, on the, the O'Hare 90 Mannheim yeah. Interchange oh, yeah. Cloverleaf, you know? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we would go through that at, you know, 65, 70 miles an hour. It's a 25 posted thing. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. Well, he trades that and comes home with a 510. And it's this tiny little loud buzz bomb box, and it's bright green with a cage. I'm like, what are you going to do with that? You know? And he's like, get in. <laughs> Hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That thing was insane. It was so much fun. Yeah. And he used to race at Road America and, okay. you know, all of the Blackhawk and the Midwest tracks and stuff. It was cool. Uh, now, without, you know, getting too far into the political side of things, there's some stuff out there that I'm, I'm hoping maybe we could shed a little bit of light on uh, yep. because, I, I, you know, sometimes I got to make it clear. I, I do work for SEMA. I don't work for SEMA. I'm not a SEMA employee. I'm a contractor. And I, fortunately, you guys allow me to show up every year and do whatever I do. But uh, I follow social media a bit and I see people and comments and stuff. And I think there's a lot of air that needs to be cleared on certain perceptions of things that, that you know, SEMA and PRI are behind. And one of them I didn't fully understand myself, and it is the the membership side, the individual membership side of SEMA and PRI is yep. here for a reason, and it's not to put cash in the pocket of PRI and SEMA. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, so it's a individual membership program, and that does a couple of things. There's a lot of consumers, a lot of enthusiasts that want to be part of SEMA in some way. For sure. So, um, and in the past, SEMA and PRI are both business to business trade trade shows and trade organizations but you know it's always been the hardest show to get into or it's always been i want to be more part of SEMA or more part of pri so uh we've created this individual membership program it's 40 dollars a year and it comes with benefits to start with so 
you can get discounts at, at Summit Racing, and you know there's all sorts oh. of discounts that will come with that membership. But the other thing that it really does is is allows us then to uh, conclude you as a member, and um, as we get political issues that you know the right to modify is our next big push. Um, uh, the right to work on vehicles and the right to modify vehicles. You know, we're, we're getting to a point now where vehicles are getting harder to hard to work, work on, they're being shut down. And uh, we're going to have to push to make sure that we can continue to enjoy our sport, to modify, to run gasoline engines on the street, right? To, to do all the things that we do. Uh, and, um, and so by having a database of all these members, we can come to you when there are big issues and say, we need you to write to your congressman. We need you to write to your senator. We want to make you aware of this thing that's going on. Um, and then, uh, secondarily, we have a pack uh, that can be donated to, and that's because we've got to be able to fund to go support the candidates that uh, uh, believe in the same things we do. Mm -hmm. And I, listen, I've never been a political guy. I've been kind of behind the scenes, but since becoming in this position. I've really seen it face to face as to what's going on. I had the opportunity to meet with a lot of senators and Congress people and walk the halls and know who's on our side, know who's against us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a battle. It really is. I, I, I used to think that was a bunch of hype, but it's a battle. So we're uh, we're working hard to to develop our army, if you like, of people, our SEMA nation and our PRI nation of people that uh, believe in the same things we do, uh, because we're going to have to fight for political causes. There's no two ways about around it. Yeah, and and the thing that that kind of blows is that we didn't pick this fight. Right. You know, as enthusiasts, we're just trying to do what we like to do. Yeah, right. There are others in the world who don't think that, and and it, it might not be that they're targeting automotive enthusiasts, saying you people are bad and we want to eliminate you. They're just going in a direction that doesn't include us. Yeah. And by not including us, sometimes there's legislation that's being written that that outlaws us, maybe even unbeknownst. Right. And if I understand this correctly, uh, an organization can't contribute directly. It has to be a, a human member tied to that donation. Yeah, correct. So SEMA cannot uh, donate to a, uh, a senator or a congressman or a legislator right. directly. Um, but as you develop a PAC, that PAC money can be used to go to that uh, that person's cause. You know, and, and so we do support uh, legislators that support us. Sure. And we keep a careful eye on what they're voting on and how they do it. And when we need help, uh, you know, we've got a, two, a full team in Washington, D.C. We just hired a new senior vice president that, uh, that's going to help us quite a bit. And uh, uh, we walk the halls and meet with people all the time, mm -hmm. all the time, and get our points across. Uh, we've got some here. There's some local congressmen uh, here in the building today that we're taking around that, that believe in what we're doing and we're showing them around the show. They're all waiting outside for us to get finished <laughs> yeah. here so they can Yeah, they can yeah. <laughs> yeah and you, you look, it's, there, there isn't a, a business organization that doesn't have to do this today. So it's, For sure, it's, yeah. It's, and, uh, and again, it's unfortunate that we have to, yeah, but is. stuff's happening beyond our control that we need yeah. to be aware of. All, all the time. There are, there are new rules and regulations that come out daily and we have a staff member that just reads what's in the pipeline that could get voted on and so that we can uh, comment and understand what's going on and dig it down onto it and really understand what's going on and decide whether or not we are in favor or oppose it. And I, I learned this past year at the SEMA show uh, from one of the staff members that, and if I understand this correctly, all the donations and, and, and all of the uh, uh, memberships are essentially audited. Yep. So if the SEMA PAC um, financially supports a candidate or something, mm -hmm. that donation is audited to see where that money came from. Uh, and if it doesn't say, oh, that's the 40 bucks from Mike Cuball Clark, right. um, then it's a red flag. So these memberships are incredibly necessary yep. uh, to provide that fair legal approach. Yeah, there's, and there's even there's even limits. Uh, if I wanted to donate to the PAC, it's a maximum of five thousand dollars a year. So it's not like, you know, if I'm some rich bazillionaire, which I'm not, but if I was, yeah, I can't um, <laughs> donate any more than that uh, per year. And, and there's rules and regulations against that. Yeah. Huh. Now, earlier you said that um, 
you thought a lot of this was just hype. And, you know, initially, like when the RPM Act uh, chatter first started to happen, you know, we were all like, oh, wow, look at that. This is a, this is a thing. And then time goes on, and time goes on, and time goes on. And we're still saying, yeah, support the RPM Act. And, and I think a lot of people are getting a little bit jaded to the urgency of this because nothing happens quickly. It does. Right. <laughs> well, that's Congress. one thing I've learned. It's like, you know, watching the sausage be made, right? It's, uh, <laughs> it takes time. I mean, when there are thousands of bills that go up, you know, every year. Uh, we're lucky right now. We're still in the last 1%. It's uh, going to get voted on here pretty quick. So uh, nice. we're working through the language of it. Um, we're hopeful that we hear something soon. It could be that it doesn't get voted on, but we think that there could be a vote here in the next couple of weeks. So we're we're all in this waiting game, which which kind of blows. You know, we're in a we're in a show where everything's about going fast. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we, don't, exactly. we don't we don't like to sit still. You know, especially people like my wife. It's like get it done. Yes, oh, but boy. but what it takes <laughs> is that continuing support. Yeah. Um, and a, a cool thing that you mentioned before is calling on members. And others to reach out to their uh, their local legislators in their state. SEMA uh, and PRI make that really really easy. If you go to the website, you literally pick the drop down on what state you're in. You fill out your name. You can click a button for a basically a pre written letter that you can modify and hit send, and it goes right to your legislators. Right. Ah. Yeah. You don't have to break out the pen and paper and, you know, think about what you're going to say. You know, <laughs> it's all right there, yeah. and it, you're free to change it however you want. Sure. But, uh, I do that periodically. Which is well, good. The, that sort of that sort of stuff helps. You know, the letters definitely help. Um, you know, we do contribute where where we can. We're not some big super fun, you know, pack, but we contribute where we can. Uh, but we've got a team that meets with these guys, talks to them, make sure that you know, they understand where we're going. Um, I've been in those meetings. Sometimes they agree with you. Sometimes they don't. So you can tell which ones don't because they. Him and Ha, and mm-hmm. find a polite way to say, "We'll look at this." And, For sure, you know, yeah. But uh, sometimes with a middle finger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, but you know, we're lucky. We've got uh, bipartisan help. You know, we got Democrats and Republicans that understand our cause. Let's, let's face it: a lot of these guys have racetracks in their backyards. You know, mm-hmm. They have consumers in their backyards that are car enthusiasts. Uh, but we got to tell them. That. Sure. Got to remind them that, hey, in your district there are uh, sixty-two. SEMA manufacturers or PRI manufacturers in your district that are bringing X amount of jobs in, yeah. that are contributing, that you know can vote for you or against you. I mean, quite honestly, and uh, uh, and we're hoping that you understand and you will support our businesses because it's the lifeline of the economy in your state. You know what we need to do. Uh-oh. All right, the same. Yeah, I know. Here, yeah. Here, here, here comes, comes. Mikey. In earlier when we were saying how you get the kids hooked by giving them a ride. Yeah. You need to have a track day that invites like all the legislators, all the legislators. You know, to have a ride. People that would never think to get in a car, put them in an electric one, you know, and just spin them around a track and say, have a fun day. Can we scare them while we're doing it? For sure. Yeah. But it's a fun <laughs> scare. Fun. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and it, it, I fully believe that it doesn't matter. And I'm just going to make up some generalization. But say you're a, a you know, a, a school teacher in a city mm-hmm. where you don't even own a car and you don't interact with any of this stuff. You get a ride in a in a Tesla Plaid. It's going to change your life, yep. you know. And then you might think, you know what, this is cool, and you can you can work in this, and people actually work in this. We actually did that. I like it uh, several times at the SEMA show in the drift cars out front. Yeah. So as legislators oh, yeah. come in, uh, we put them in drift cars. And- but a lot of those people were already the choir. They were. Yeah. yeah they for sure. Let's see if there's a, is there a track in D.C. or you know yeah. up, up and down the National Mall, you know, and do laps. What do you think? We could just shut the streets down and do right. it. Right. Yeah. The F1 guys we know need to, to shut the committee down. on this. <laughs> <laughs> and then make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. No Great kidding. Um, so, talking about the SEMA show once again, there's some fun things coming for the consumer side. Yep. Again, as we, you know, the SEMA show has been the hardest show that everybody wants to get into <laughs> that can't. And uh, that's been the great for years because it is business to business. But we recognize that. We recognize the SEMA brand has, you know, a lot of influence and people want to come and enthusiasts want to come. So uh, for 2023, we're going to have SEMA Fest mm-hmm. and it'll start on Friday. Uh, the SEMA show goes Tuesday through Friday. On Friday, there'll be a limited edition, uh, limited amount of tickets that will, you can actually buy to go into the SEMA show itself and kick around the SEMA show. But in addition to that, you'll go to SEMA Fest, which will be across the way uh, 
We just rented out 39 acres of land. And it's going to be a festival-style event for consumers. Music, cars. For, for consumers. Yes. For consumers. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, uh, this concept is uh, it's really SEMA Week and then SEMA Fest. Uh, but the, the goal is eventually to make it a lot like South by Southwest, where we just take over the city of Las Vegas and it becomes Car Week. And uh, That's incredible. there'll be a lot of events. But, but for 23, it'll be uh, in this 29, 39-acre uh place that we'll do drift we'll probably do some off-road work we're looking at doing a car auction uh there'll be music friday night there'll be music uh saturday night you know big big name music Mm -hmm. um cars uh everything's uh, just to celebrate car kind of car yeah and i think it's awesome and there's a whole bunch of things to consider you know as you can imagine and and i was fortunate enough to um actually be in a little bit of a planning meeting on wednesday about they let me in for some reason. Uh, yeah, but, they didn't let me in. They yeah, I know. Me in, right? And then I'd probably be uh, so, Someone had to hold the coats. So. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I didn't say I participated. Uh, but the uh, there's a difference between the B2B show and a consumer show. Right. And every consumer that, you know, every hot rod enthusiast and, and race enthusiast and car enthusiast wants to get in the SEMA show to see the stuff. And I think a lot of them don't realize that there's a lot of, like, not fun things that happen at the SEMA show. There's deals that are made. There's talk about you know order quantities and shipping and pricing and all that stuff that a, that a consumer really a doesn't really care about, but b businesses need to get this stuff hashed right. out, so they don't necessarily have the time to talk to you about your seventy four Nova and you know what sway bar fits it. But by creating a consumer side uh, event and maybe bringing some of those exhibitors over, plus having all of the fun things to do. This is really a great thing uh, for for consumers to, and I, I don't want them to think that they're getting SEMA light. Right. You know, they're not getting the SEMA show because right. they're not getting the stuff that they don't want to be in anyway. Right. Correct. And so. then, uh, so today, you know, you have the SEMA Ignited event where after all the cars leave the show, they do the SEMA cruise, and a bunch of them go to Ignited, and there's a there's a party there Friday night. That's kind of like the intro to this. SEMA Fest is going to be far more of a, a destination type event that you'll want to come from New Jersey to come spend a day and a half or the weekend at, um, as opposed to Ignited, which is only a few hours, you know, and people, you know, don't get, uh, uh, you know, the full experience. So it, it's going to be really cool to see how it comes together. Yeah, this will have Kraft Foods, again, Drift, probably do some off-road stuff, a car auction, car show. But you can imagine as this thing grows that, you know, we'll invite the Mustang Owners Club and the Ferrari Owners Club yeah. and the, you know, people come up from all over uh, and drive with their clubs to come in for a week of car week, yeah. week. Yeah. Um, and then it's tight, you know, possibly at the front end with an NHRA drag race, a mm-hmm. NASCAR race potentially, Formula One will be right behind us, backing up right behind us, so mm-hmm. it's just going to be... The Concord at Win. The Concord at Win as well, yeah, so you'll, you're right, so that it's just a... Uh, it's going to be, and you've got hotel space there, you've got roads that are clear, you've got all those sorts of things that just make Las Vegas. Oh, yeah, and there's some gambling, too, I guess. Sure, uh, there's, there's uh, know, shows but, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, there's yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the real show will be watching all the cars cruise in. You know. Yeah, well, and, but I think some of the, um, the overspill of that is people do go to Vegas just to go to Vegas. And and this might be a thing where it's like, oh, wow, we didn't know this was happening, but we're going. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and it's a good time of year. You know, uh, most of the racing season's done. It's um, it's a good time of year in Las Vegas. The weather's good, mm-hmm. uh, typically. But, um, yeah, I can I can envision over the next couple of years, car clubs driving in, cruising from, you know, thousands of miles away to, to come and be part of this, this week-long celebration of everything cars and trucks it's not going to happen anywhere else right that's the thing right. this, this is for real and it's it's going to be a special special thing so you're going to drive your your maxi van out there i'll drive my gto there you go we'll be part of the sema fest yeah right on i gotta figure out how you to get it, it in you're the witness. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did get i did get the wheels you got them they're in the bed of my truck here heck right. yeah. yeah yeah right love it Speaking of which, they are American racing wheels. Are they? they yeah, are. Are yeah. They daisies or what are they? They are. They are not. But that's interesting you bring that up because uh, our our listeners are all waiting with bated <laughs> breath to know the answer to our riveting trivia questions. 
So, all right. Uh, I appreciate all the updates, Mike, um, and, and, and taking the time. But now we're going to get down to the real business. All right. So, I asked you fellas, uh, what car was Bonnie and Clyde driving when they were gunned down? Right. And Mike just said, the Buick. Nice, nice, nice. to the point answer. Kevin said, 40 Buick. Well, unfortunately, guys, uh. that's not correct. The correct answer is a 1934 Ford Model B, Model 40B wow. four-door deluxe sedan. So the B stood for Buick. What's that? The B stood, the, for, the Buick. B stood yeah. for Buick. <laughs> okay, so you're both right. Congratulations. Yeah. Nicely done. Uh, all right. uh. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, so I asked you gentlemen, where did the American Racing 200S style wheel get its name, right? Mm. Uh, it's also known as the Daisy and the Coke bottle style. Uh, and uh, cue ball, well, Mr. Spagnola said 200 mile per hour mm. is a 200 super sport, which is, uh, is a great answer. And cue ball said a 200, it was a 200th design iteration, mm. and it's the 200 series was the thing. Well, your bags is pretty close. Uh, in oh, fact, nice. I'm going to give it to you because what? it was at the time advertised to be guaranteed good over 200 miles an hour okay wow yes and the s stood for satin it was a satin 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 spoke oh oh, man Uh, but the one of the reasons why this question came up is i've had american racing wheels on the brain because i just got a set for my van Um, but also it was an uh an evolution of the libra wheel right which uh was possible popular on a lot of dots and race cars back in the day and uh, so 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 there you go very cool so Mr. Spagnola wins, Mr. So it was not the 200th iteration. It, it, it could have, could have been, no, but not. But no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Possible. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm closest to the pin, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you are. Yeah, you are yeah. closest to the pin. You, yeah. you get the nod. Okay. Nicely right. done. Yes. Right. There you go. But way off on the view. Of- yeah, well, we're Sorry, both way off. You shaped right? that yeah, one. Yeah, but that I remember now that you said that from Ford. I, as you yeah. said it, I was like, that's right. I knew that at one time. Yeah, yeah. He was giving me a hard time uh, yesterday as I walked through the show because of you, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. He goes, oh, look, it's the mayor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. The mayor seems the far, mayor far, far from it. <laughs> Well, again, thanks for joining us. I know you're a busy you. man, and uh, it's great to be able to take the time and uh, in, in our little forum here. So, yeah, appreciate thank you. that. Thank yeah, you for yeah. support you guys. You guys have been great supporters of SEMA, PRI, and all the stuff we're trying to get done. And thanks for letting us get kind of our message out. Always, anytime. Treasure. It's good for all of us. Yeah. So. All right. All right, man. Well, uh, if you uh, uh, enjoy this kind of show, hit that subscribe button, and a, a new episode will magically appear in your inbox, uh, just like that. <laughs> and uh, for Mr. Mike Cuball clark and uh, Mike Spagnola, I'm Kevin Oste. Thanks for listening to V8 Radio. And uh, just keep going fast. Yeah. Or 200. Or 200. There you go. Supporters of SEMA, PRI, and all the stuff we're trying to get done. And thanks for letting us get kind of our message out. Always, anytime. It's good for all of us. So, all right, right, man. Well, uh, if you uh, uh, enjoy this kind of show, hit that subscribe button, and a a new episode will magically appear in your inbox, uh, just like that. (laughs) And uh, for Mr. Mike Cuball Clark and uh, Mike Spagnola, I'm Kevin Oste. Thanks for listening to V8 Radio. And uh, just keep going fast. Yeah. Or 200. There are 200. There you go.